All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our last webinar of the year. <clears throat> By way of a very brief introduction, I'm Ron Brill, President and Chairman of AnglePoint. Um, for those of you who don't know AnglePoint, we're a global software asset um, and, and, uh, and cloud asset management firm. Um, and for the last three years, we've been uh, leading the Gartner Magic Quadrant for our industry. Um, outside of AnglePoint, I uh, am chairing the um, ISO committee for ITAM standards. That's the committee that owns the ISO 19770 uh, family of standards, has participants from uh, 25 countries um, working on the uh, ISO standards. Uh, I'm also um, the project editor for the next edition, the fourth edition of 19770-1 uh, for ITAM system uh, as part of that. Uh, I also uh, participate uh, in the ITAM forum on the board of trustees and, and vice chair, um, and I also lead the um, co-lead the ITAM and FinOps um, special interest group as part of the FinOps Foundation. Um, again, we're very exciting to be uh, speaking with you all. Uh, one of the things we were hoping to do today uh, is really focus on where we're seeing the ITAM industry heading in the next five plus years. And this is based on our uh, daily work and conversations with hundreds of enterprise clients around the world. Uh, that's kind of the primary source. Most of those are kind of within the Fortune Global 1000 and, um, and so on. So getting really good perspective from, from that, as well as um, what we're hearing from uh, the analyst firms, uh, industry events, um, um, conversations within uh, within ISO, uh, outside our specific committee as well. And so we've kind of consolidated all those different inputs and, and, uh, and put this together, which is kind of the top 10 trends that we're able to, uh, to point to at this point in time. And they're uh, kind of ranked in order of, of impact, although that is uh, not a very scientific exercise. It's more directional um, as far as how much impact those are going to have on what we do in IT asset management. I will say the focus here is really kind of a long-term uh, perspective. There are obviously a lot of uh, shorter-term trends uh, that are happening as well. Um, and maybe if we have time at the end, we can touch on those things like, uh, um, you know, inflation, recession, software vendors increasing their maintenance uh, fees and, and other things that are happening, kind of a skill shortage, um, kind of higher turnover in the industry uh, and, and so on. Uh, they're kind of more short term that we're not going to touch on today. So these are kind of more more the long term items. And on some of those I've, I've spoken in the past. Um, I'm going to give a very brief overview. As, as you can imagine, we have uh, kind of effectively 45 minutes to cover 10 topics, so we're not going to be able to do each one of these justice, but the idea is to kind of have a high-level overview, touch on some of the key points, and uh, really happy to continue the discussion on uh, each and every one of these. Um, there's a lot more on each and every one of these that we're going to be able to touch on today. So let's get started. The first one, as you can see, is... Uh, FinOps. Uh, we've been talking a lot about FinOps. Uh, it's probably kind of the most uh, significant shift or impact on IT asset management that we've seen, uh, you know, the last decade or two for a number of different reasons. Um, and the impact is just starting to, to get felt uh, for many organizations. They're not there yet as far as what their ITAM programs are doing about it. Um, so let's touch on that very high level. So kind of as, as by way of, of background, um, you know, we're looking at the IT infrastructure nowadays. We're, it's really hybrid in almost every organization, certainly the larger organizations, but even smaller organizations have a hybrid infrastructure. And these are some of the, the, th the three main components of the, that infrastructure is on-prem, there's cloud infrastructure and platform services, and there's SaaS and probably other components as well, mobile devices and others are not in here. And if we just look at it from a, the perspective of cost of IT assets, 
which is what we're interested in primarily. There are a number of other aspects as well, but just from that perspective, right? There's the there's the cost of the SaaS subscriptions. There's the cost of the physical infrastructure and the software that runs on that physical infrastructure. And then for cloud infrastructure platform services, there's the cost of the virtual infrastructure and the software that runs on that virtual infrastructure that can come from uh, one of three main sources is it's proprietary to the cloud service provider, uh, it's third party software, you know, think you know, Oracle, IBM, so on, or it's homegrown uh, software. Third party software, you can acquire it through two different channels, either through a marketplace that's run by your cloud service provider, uh, or uh, bring your own license, uh, use your own traditional licenses that you have as part of enterprise agreements and so on. The interesting thing here is um, that, you know, Gart mentioned that for an increasing number of organizations, this one box here, the cost of the virtual infrastructure is greater than the cost of all the, the software components combined on-prem um, as well as uh, SaaS combined. And it's uh, uh, the trend is definitely for this to get even larger. So uh, with this being kind of the larger piece here, uh, if we are ignoring this as ITAM, uh, we are really risking uh, not remaining relevant to the business in the long term. So this one is the largest box for many organizations. It's becoming even larger. Uh, it's a very clear trend. Uh, we have to look at this box if you want to remain relevant. And there's a lot of reasons why it's hard to do that. Uh, we're not going to touch on all of them, but it's it's uh, it's very complex. Uh, hundreds of features and pricing options every year coming out from every one of the cloud service providers. And most of our clients, for example, are uh, multi-cloud, right? So it just, just gets compounded. Uh, very difficult to analyze, right? The, a monthly bill from AWS could be hundreds of millions of lines in just for just one month very, very difficult to, to get your hands around that. And a um, number of other challenges as well. And all these lead to the need to have uh, cloud financial management. The most the dominant methodology out there uh, is FinOps and by the FinOps Foundation. Really encourage you to, to check them out uh, if you're interested in FinOps. Lots of great resources. Participation is free for end user organizations. Um, this is the, the book that kind of started it all, um, and we have uh, certifications and, and other things. So really great resource for anything uh, FinOps. The FinOps methodology is based on uh, three uh, main phases, uh, inform, optimize, and operate. Um, during inform, we are really looking to get um, transparency into what the data is. During Optimize, we're looking to reduce costs. And during Operate, we're looking to automate uh, a lot of the uh, procedures that are happening. Um, this structure is actually quite similar to the uh, structure, the tier structure that's currently in 19770-1 for ITAM. So if you think in form, it's really the first tier in ITAM is trustworthy data. So it's kind of equivalent. Um, the third tier in the ITAM standard is, uh, is Optimize optimization, which is kind of equivalent to the optimized phase, and the lifecycle integration, which is a second tier in ITAM, is kind of equivalent to the operate phase. So it's, it's kind of a similar three-phase methodology overall. Um, there's work that's been done to, to see how it aligns at a much um, more granular, uh, granular level that we're not going to touch on today. Um, but just keep, keep in mind that the two are kind of equivalent. So during the inform phase, it's really all about um, agreeing on it, the taxonomy within the organization, uh, tagging, which is uh, kind of the metadata you can attach to your cloud instances, um, identify things like workloads, applications, business units, and so forth. Once you have tagging deployed, you can create dashboards that report on cloud usage and cloud costs, two different things. Um, and provide that information near real time to all the relevant stakeholders who need that information, be it engineering or others. Um, and then showing that um, information back so more optimized decisions could be made. So that's kind of inform. Um, again, basic thing, if you don't have that, you can't do anything else. You're essentially blind. Um, next, there's uh, optimization. We're not going to go a whole lot of details here, but 
There are two types of optimizations that happen with InfinUps. You can optimize how much of the cloud you consume, the quantity. So assume let's let's assume that the, the, the rates, the pricing is fixed for a moment. How can we reduce our consumption to really what we need? Right. So this this activity, which has to be decentralized and done by the engineering teams, um, is really things like looking at um, unneeded instances, zombie instances, smart scheduling. Uh, you know, turn it off when you don't need it. Uh, right sizing, making sure it's not over provisioned for the workloads that that are actually running on it. So these are some of the activities there. Um, and then the other type of optimization is pricing or rate optimization. So assume from kind of the, the opposite, assume the consumption is fixed and you've already optimized it. Now, how can we get the best rates on that con optimized consumption? Well, this includes things like contract negotiation, savings plan, reserved instances, spot instances, uh, choosing the right provider for the right workload, uh, and a number of other activities. This is typically done in a centralized fashion. Uh, but again, FinOps and ITAM facilitate both um, as far as the tooling and the reporting and the capabilities and the guidance. Um, and one activity is more centralized, the other one uh, is more decentralized. Uh, and a lot of really great uh, knowledge that's evolving around this and best practices. And um, it's amazing what some organization will be able to do from a cost saving perspective. Organizations that don't do this, um, you know, typically would have waste within the cloud that's, you know, 30 or more percent of their spend. And considering that this is the largest box, with, as we saw on the previous slide, um, you can imagine how critical doing this is. And the last phase in the FinOps uh, methodology is really about um, a lot of it about automation, um, you know, metrics-driven cost optimization and other activities because of the kind of ephemeral nature of cloud instances where an asset can live for, for days and hours and minutes or seconds, right? Um, trying to do any kind of manual optimization is really not ideal. You're leaving a lot of money on the table, right? So... What we're trying to do is create automation to ensure that optimized decisions are, are made from the fir very fir first moment. Uh, and it's really the only way to have any measure of control uh, within the cloud on, on costs is, is to do that through automation. It's kind of a paradigm shift as well. If you think about the ITAM equivalent of this, you know, we're used to doing, you know, annual license reconcil reconciliations for a software vendor or, or quarterly reconciliations, or maybe for a very critical vendor, it'll be a monthly reconciliation. Uh, well, that that doesn't really cut it anymore in the cloud, right? It has to be done near real time. The only way to do that is through automation. And there are a lot of reasons why ITAM and FinOps need to be collaborating, whether they're both part of the, the same function or they're two separate functions, but working very closely together. They really have kind of shared objectives, shared principles, shared domains. We didn't get a chance to go into that level of detail, but um, that exists. There's a separate webinar that I did on FinOps. You can find more information there. There's more information still. They really address each other's mutual blind spots. Um, you know, ITEM looks at things that FinOps doesn't and vice versa. Uh, to, together, they really get kind of that one infrastructure view uh, that's really critical. Um, you know, you can't separate the, the infrastructure. It's one hybrid infrastructure. Um, you know, you can't separate sometimes the vendor relationships, right? The same Microsoft agreement can have, um, you know, on-prem license provisions as well as things like Azure Commit, Azure Hybrid, hybrid Use Benefits and so forth. So it, you really have to look at um, those agreements holistically from a vendor management perspective as well. Um, you know, BYOL is another example. You know, ITEM can't do its job without looking at consumption of licenses in the cloud, which uh, FinOps typically would not look at. Uh, they'll have visibility of the cloud instances, but not too much to the third-party software that runs on them in many cases. Um, get, uh, as we mentioned, multiple procurement channels for the same product sometimes. You can buy it off of your enterprise agreement that's already been centrally negotiated by procurement, or you can buy the same product by going to the AWS marketplace and paying for it uh, as part of your uh, monthly cloud bill on a subscription basis, right? And so it's really all those different sources of procurement channels and all those other things really necessitate 
those two functions working closely together. Uh, if you're interested in this space, really encourage you to join the special interest group as part of the foundation that's talking about this. All right, so FinOps definitely having a huge impact. The other one I want to talk about, or the second one, is uh, technology business management, TBM, uh, which is really uh, one specific methodology to uh, implement IT financial management, ITFM. So you may be familiar more with ITFM uh, as a term rather than TBM. TBM is a specific one. And what, what is TBM? It's really trying to um, help organizations translate technology investments to business value. Um, so basically allowing to run IT like a business, run IT with the business, um, and allow a conversation to happen between finance, IT, and the business units and you know, using taxonomy and language that all three parties understand versus uh, just IT or just finance. And there are a number of uh, benefits that could be driven and could be affected once you have that in place. And so what is it based on? Uh, based on a methodology that's... Uh, the TBM Council is behind. I uh, encourage you to check them out. Uh, Aptio is the uh, firm that's kind of behind the TBM Council. Uh, there's a book that came out that highlight, you know, uh, outlines the methodology, their certifications, um, and they have really great resources about uh, TBM. And again, this is just one methodology for doing IT financial management. You can you can follow any other. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of change where you actually you know look under the hood. Um, what is it? Uh, so this is kind of uh, the, the picture of the taxonomy that we're talking about, right? So finance's view of the business is really all around cost, cost pools, the general ledger entries, right? That's how finance sees the world of IT uh, through the general ledger, ledger, ledger entries and so forth. So you see some of the main categories here. Um, hardware, software, and external services, which includes cloud and SaaS. That's where it lives. Those three are of the most interest to us, right? So if, you've, uh, if you're paying, you know, Oracle $1 million a year, it'll be part of, of what you see measure here in the software. That's cost pools of the view, but IT doesn't view itself that way. IT views itself mostly in, within the context of IT towers, which is the term that the TBM methodology uses. That's how IT runs itself internally. That's how IT refers to itself. Um, as well as uh, looking at uh, things like infrastructures and platforms and so forth. But this is kind of how I, IT views itself. When you get to, well, what is running on those infrastructures and platforms and so forth, as well, those are things like applications, products, and services. And that's the first level that's actually visible to the business as well, that the business has an understanding of. And um, those applications, products, and services then drive things like uh, a customer and partner facing applications and solutions, uh, enabling business units, and so forth. So this is the business view of the business, which is essentially what you see here, plus maybe applications, products, and services. This is the IT view of the business. And this is the cost pool, which is the finance view of the business. What this taxonomy allows you to do once you have that in place is really to have that translation from one end to another and be able to express costs in terms of the business value that they bring. So for example, if you're paying, going back to what we said before, you're paying Oracle $1 million a year, you'd be able to say that you know 50K out of that 1 million is driving at the end, you know, application XYZ is part of business unit A that's driving $10 million worth of revenue for the business, right? You'll be able to do that translation all across. If you um, look at just the FinOps view, um, and you can see those the specific elements that FinOps touches on, FinOps was kind of designed from the start to fit within this model. Um, so for those of you familiar with the FinOps methodology, it's really all about that having that transparency, have that show back, having using unit economics to express value within the cloud and so forth. So FinOps kind of does TBM just for that for that cloud uh, slice of IT. But TBM is really about all of IT, not just the cloud. 
Um, and the interesting thing as well here is um, that um, if you look at sustainability, which we're going to touch on in a minute, um, it can actually fit very nicely within this overall model because it's essentially, if you're just looking at the taxonomy piece of of TBM, it's kind of a um, a chargeback mechanism, uh, on kind of a chargeback on steroids, if you will. It does many other things, but just this translation model, this taxonomy, you can view it as a, as a chargeback model and um, almost like it's a black box where you put something on one end and it allocates it to, um, based on the rules that you've built to the right business units and applications and so on. And the business KPIs, be it revenue, daily users, or what, whatever your, your unit economic uh, metrics are. Well, you can put dollars on one end and have them allocated, or you can put tons of CO2 and have them allocated the same way. So if you know that, you know, an external, it's AWS, uh, you get a report from them monthly that says this is your carbon footprint this last month, you'd be able to, to allocate it using the, the exact same model to all the right uh, customer partner facing applications and be able to say each one of them, what is the carbon footprint that that application uh, generates. But as we mentioned, um, the model is, TBM is about a lot more than just kind of a, a fancy chargeback mechanism, although that's, that's kind of the basis for it. What it really allows you to do, and there's a whole methodology behind it, is have what, what TBM model calls the four value conversations, which essentially are the four key questions that every CIO need, needs to ask themselves, right? And this is kind of almost like the job description of a of a CIO. Two of these questions have to do with running the business. Two of these questions have to do with evolving, growing, changing the business, right? Are we delivering the right performance for the best price? Uh, are we spending our resources to get the biggest return possible on those resources, right? Are we maximizing our innovation dollars? Are we improving the speed of the business and so forth? So once you see this, then I think uh, it all comes together in the sense of the value that ITAM and FinOps bring to the business. Because if we go back to the, to the previous model, these three boxes, cloud services, uh, software and hardware are where most of the heavy lifting takes place, right? Uh, for many of these others, it's relatively straightforward um, or more straightforward, I uh, would say. This is where a lot of the heavy lifting is happening. And this model allows you to really just take it to the last mile and make the data relevant to the CIO by supporting um, this. So in essentially what TBM does for item and FinOps, first of all, it's the glue that's kind of where, you know, FinOps and item kind of hangs together at the level where they meet and, and, and kind of um, work together to provide the CIO with that single pane of glass of transparency into the IT organization and enable the CIO to have conversation with their C-suite peers across the organization and really elevate the discussion uh, and show the value of, of what we do. And that's one of the things that uh, that I like about uh, TBM, IT financial management in general. You know, with the pace of uh, decision-making within our organization uh, having significantly increased post-pandemic, this these conversations are becoming going to become a lot more relevant um, to everything that we do. Um, essentially, what what this, this conversation allows us to do is is move the perception of IT from being a cost center to being a business value driver, and as you do that, you're evolving the conversation from one that's focused on cost to one that's focused on value. And this is really what we're trying to do in the model. I think an ITAM already does that to an extent. FinOps already does that to an extent. IT financial management TBM does that for all of IT and kind of brings it all together in a more uh, consistent manner that. Uh, would be relevant for a CIO to consume. There are a lot of uh, case studies that uh, you can find them on the, the TBM Council of uh, large companies that have uh, transformed themselves with TBM. Um, and again, just as a reminder, a big part of uh, what TBM is, is really ITAM and FinOps. All right, let's talk about sustainability. Uh, again, a major trend that's that's happening. Uh, it's going to hit all of us uh, over the next few years in a big way. Um, so who cares about um, sustainability? 
The general term that you may have heard used is ESG, environmental, social governance. Sustainability is kind of part of environmental, also some governance aspects to it. Uh, and sustainability is really about a lot of things. One of them re being the major one that's getting a lot of attention is greenhouse gas emissions, but it's certainly not limited to that. There's talk about, you know, wasting water, talking about just waste in general, and then a lot of other things, uh, you know, not hurting the environment more generally. But uh, let, let's just, we're going to focus just on greenhouse gas emissions for, for now, but just to know the picture is, is much bigger than that. And uh, there are a lot of drivers for that. It really doesn't matter if you believe in global warming or not. Uh, this is happening. Regulators are asking for this, uh, where this is the uh, uh, CSRD, uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive within the AU, starting to have requirements starting in 2024, whether it's the SEC announced uh, requirements for U.S. public companies to report co more consistently uh, on what they do in this space, uh, IFRS and others. Regulators are asking for this. Uh, investors' boards are asking for this. Uh, management is asking for this. Um, there's been all kinds of surveys showing how every year the percentage of CIOs that consider sustainability to be a top priority increases dramatically from year to year. Um, there's some some research on that by by Gartner and others that you can see. Um, so management and boards and managements are caring about this, and that means CIOs are going to care about this one way or another as well. Um, consumers and partners care about this. Um, you know, it's uh, many companies, and you take Salesforce.com, for example, they already require their vendors um, to have commitments in their contracts around getting to uh, um, zero carbon emissions and other, and other objectives as well. Employees are asking for this, right? Uh, particularly with the younger generations, they're deciding which company they want to work for based on how green that company is. Um, so this is coming um, from a number of different ways. Um, it's viewed on, and I'm, I'm borrowing some, some graphics here from, uh, from Gartner. Um, you can view it as in three scopes. There's um, upstream activities. So this is everything that happens before the company does its business, whether whatever that business is, service or manufacturing, or whatever it is. So this is things like the company procures, business travels, transportation, employee commute, everything that happens before it gets to the company uh, is, is kind of a scope three. Um, scope two is the uh, electricity and water and everything that's been purchased by the company. Scope one is what emissions are being generated by the company assets directly. Uh, and then the other part of scope three is kind of downstream, which is what happens after the product or the service leaves your uh, leaves your company, and there are different types of emissions. They're kind of collectively viewed as CO two equivalent, CO two e, um, because it's uh, inconvenient to talk about different different types of emissions. But this is kind of the general uh, picture. And the v when you hear about scope one, scope two, scope three, um, you have a better feel for what um, what is being discussed there. And how does that uh, impact IT? This is kind of for the business in general. How does that impact IT? Well, IT certainly generates um, a lot of carbon emissions. We're gonna to touch about where those come from. Um, and what's important to mention here is that the magnitude of the what IT does, carbon emissions that are generated by IT will change from organization to organization, right? So if you're, uh, uh, heavy technology-based organization, take Netflix, for example, right? Like 100% of their, or nearly 100% of their carbon footprint will be generated by, by their IT. Um, if you're a company like um, FedEx or UPS, right? Uh, probably 99.999% of your carbon footprint is generated by your fleet of airplanes and diesel trucks around the world and, and so forth. And, and IT will be a much smaller par portion of that. Uh, but with, whatever, uh, portion IT is within the overall um, carbon footprint, uh, there's what is the internal distribution within IT. And this is what uh, Gordon has been saying is kind of a typical organization today. And of course it varies from organization to organization. Um, one, one observation here is that outsourced services, which is where things like um, cloud and SaaS fall right now, they're saying a typical organization that 18%, 
that is by far the fastest growing element, right? So if we're looking at this picture, you know, five years from now, I would expect this to be uh, the dominant uh, tower within uh, where carbon footprint is generated uh, as part of IT organizations. And there's a ISO standard for this, uh, 14001. It's a management system standard. So just like the 19770-1, it's based on the Deming cycle of continuous improvement, plan, do, check, act. Um, and um, it's kind of the best adopted international standard for sustainability. There, there are three main activities, right? You need to understand your requirements. What are, what are the organization's requirements? Um, so it could be the regulatory requirement or your board or your CEO have committed um, to a to certain, uh, made certain commitments that go above and beyond what the regulatory requirements are, which is sometimes the case. So actually, I'd say more than often that's the case. Then you need to look into how you measure it. How do you measure carbon footprint within, within IT? And um, then how do you look into optimizing and reducing that carbon footprint? Um, what I uh, should have mentioned as well, that within IT, what tends to generate the carbon emissions is really the IT assets. Uh, if you look at, okay, where, where, is the, where are the emissions coming from within IT? It's really all tied to the assets and the life cycle of the assets. And guess who is the function that looks into IT assets in, the, in that life cycle? Well, it's, it's ITAM. And so ITAM, um, I believe, will have a huge, huge role in um, being kind of the focal point within IT to uh, drive initiatives related to sustainability. Uh, again, just because we are the function who looks at the life cycle of the IT assets. And we can look at it, uh, you know, in this distinction of on-prem versus cloud. Uh, on-prem is hardware and software. Hardware is the most um, often discussed area of uh, sustainability for within ITAM, right? Talking about what happens to the hardware, you know, before it gets to the organization, the power consumption within the, during its useful life, and then things that you can do um, to improve that. You know, you want to have effective terms and conditions in your contracts with your suppliers. You want to extend the life of the asset, uh, even if you extend the life of a server or, or, or a laptop by one year, it can have a huge impact. Uh, on the carbon footprint. Um, many of the recent regulation around right to repair and so forth actually were driven because of sustainability concerns more than anything else. And then there's, of course, the whole discussion around this, the circular economy, right? If you can um, reuse the equipment, if you can refurbish it, if you can uh, use parts, uh, use it for parts uh, or, if, or even for raw materials, or if you can denote it, all those all those things really drive down your your uh, carbon footprint. You're able to claim credits for those things. Um, that's a huge huge discussion that's happening, and of course, uh, eliminating unneeded hardware and, and right sizing the hardware, I'm sure it's not of respect for what it needs, uh, what needs to run on it, and so forth. So a lot of discussion hardware, but I would say actually most of the impact um, the IT assets on on um, sustainability is going to be around software and cloud by far. And it, it, I, I'm, I'm, I believe we're actually going to see the discussion shifting from a focus on hardware only, like it has been so far, to a focus on software and cloud, because that's where most of the impact is going to be. So with software, there's a, a kind of some carbon footprint in the development of the software. Um, the hardware and power requirements are heavily impacted by how efficient that software is. There's uh, initiatives like the Green Software Foundations and so forth that are looking to um, promote software development to minimize uh, environmental impact. So the software will be more efficient, will demand less power. And why is that important? If you look at the, a typical server, uh, and this is just, just directional, you know, it's not exact numbers, right? Uh, if you look at the typical server, only about 25% of the power consumption is generated by the hardware plus the operating system that runs on that hardware. The remaining 75% of the power consumption is really driven by the software. How efficient that software is, what workloads are running on it, um, how well is it architected, you know, you know, sometimes, you know, like a cluster architecture could be more efficient than others and so forth. We're not going to have time to get into this, but 
um, 75% of the power consumption that could be driven by software, not the hardware. Uh, and so if you're missing that piece, um, you're missing a huge piece here. And of course, everything we do in ITAM to uh, remove shelfware and, and so forth uh, has a direct impact on the carbon footprint as well. Um, then, of course, cloud, in one sense, it's easy because carbon emissions are, you know, have to be self-reported by the provider. And everything we, we do is part of FinOps, like we talked about, elimination of unneeded, right-sizing, uh, and so forth. Um, efficient scheduling and so forth, all those have a direct impact on energy reducing cloud consumption. Again, this is, but uh, even even just CIPS is the largest box as we as we saw within the hybrid infrastructure. And if you add SAS to it, you can see that this one here is going to be the main way, the main way that you're going to be able to control your your carbon emissions. Um, I attended a uh, Gartner conference last week, the IOCS um, conference, where one of the analysts said that. Uh, uh, carbon emissions in cloud could be 90% uh, lower, 990, as compared to, um, you know, long term, as compared to running those workloads on prem for a number of different reasons um, related to the cloud providers, you know, economies of scale and their ability to drive much higher, higher utilization. So if a typical utilization in the data center is 40%, you know, uh, when that servers that are running but being run by AWS and Azure it's you know 85 plus percent uh, and a number of other reasons they're uh, they're able to tap renewable energy in a much better way and then do a lot of other things um, so again a lot of opportunity for for ITAM to play a leading role within IT and being the focal point for sustainability and again this is an item that's on the CEO's agenda right and I think it's going to be a huge missed opportunity if uh, ITAM did not take the leadership on this all right, let's talk uh, more briefly about the remaining ones we have. Uh, subscriptions, right? The whole economy is moving to a subscription base. There's, of course, SaaS. Um, Marketplace acquired software is, is becoming more and more um, mainstream. The kind of a main way companies are uh, procuring their softwares compared to traditional enterprise agreements and so forth. Uh, many software vendors have announced they're going to gradually transition to subscription based licenses for on-prem as well. So moving away from perpetual licenses into subscriptions. So the whole direction is very, very clear in the industry. Um, it's going to be a big part of what ITAM does. Um, the methodologies are different. Uh, the approaches are different. Um, but this is going to be a major, major item. Already is and becoming even more so in over the next few years. So if, if this is not something you're looking at, um, you definitely should. Licensing complexity is, is continuing to increase uh, instead of decreasing. Um, if you use some of the merging technologies, uh, many of, the, of them related to cloud, but not all, you know, virtual containers, Kubernetes have interesting implications from a licensing perspective. Uh, when you're doing running things like with serverless and function as a service. Um, or functional platform as a service, uh, robotic process automations, bots and APIs, indirect access also kind of uh, present new challenges to how you interpret license agreements and use cases, um, hybrid use of bring your own license, um, and so on. So the overall message here is that licensing complexity is going up, not down. Um, and we're definitely expecting to, to continue to, uh, to see that happen. Next one is composable business. And this is a, a term that uh, Gartner has coined. It, essentially what it is, is citizens development. Uh, used to be viewed as a bad thing a few years ago, right? They call it shadow IT, rogue IT, uh, and so forth. But now it's considered kind of mainstream and actually considered a best practice, right? You want your business units to use their uh, business technologies. P people are tech savvy within those business units to, to drive um, their own IT innovation, to build application, to subscribe to SaaS. You want them doing all these things. And again, this is kind of a pendulum has, has shifted, right? It's considered something that really helps with improving the agility of the business, respond to the market, improving resiliency, improving innovation, and so forth. So kind of moving away from, okay, if a business unit needs something done, they ask central IT and IT will get to it. If it has budget and resources within, you know, a year or two, um, that's not that's not 
how businesses are run anymore, right? If a business unit needs something, they need it now and they're going to do it. And so the role of IT and the role of ITAM within IT is changing, you know, from kind of a command and control model, which is kind of where ITAM started to more of a um, distributed uh, governance model where the role of ITAM is now more to provide tools and templates, to provide reports, to provide guidance, to collect information and really enable those business units to be effective, right? You're not going to control what they do, but you want to provide them with the tools and the reporting and the data so they can be effective in what they do. Um, this is particularly relevant for SaaS, um, where it's been a huge, huge increase in uh, uh, SaaS applications that business units are engaging with uh, directly, completely bypassing IT, uh, but not only. Um, a lot of other as well. So again, this, this is a this is a mind shift for how item needs to run, right? Completely changing kind of the model. Um, and again, those those item programs are going to be able to make those transitions and 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 remain effective and relevant in this new world. Are going to be the one that's going to survive. Um, again, a whole lot of discussions about that um, that we won't have time to get into now. But a very interesting area. Uh, another one is information security. Um, I spent a whole lot of time on that, but see, there's a growing realization that uh, you can't secure what you don't know you have, right? They have all kind of different terminology that's coming up for this, like cyber asset, tax surface management, uh, and other things. But the, I guess, the basics here is that you uh, you can't do uh, cybersecurity uh, if you don't have effective IT asset management even basic things like patch management, incident response, all these require knowing what, what you have and where you have it. Um, just the role of IT in, of ITAM in reducing just the number of uh, different versions and addition products that are running out there uh, already improves the security posture of any organization, let alone removing uh, unauthorized software. Um, security in the supply chain, like the solar winds incident and so forth is becoming uh, more important. Software bill of material is very, um, critical item right now. There's been legislation, executive order in the US. There's a lot of work done on this at ISO and elsewhere. Is This is kind of a response to the log4j and similar incidents. Um, there's, there are ISO standards for this. Uh, again, this is getting a lot of attention. Um, they get even more um, going forward. Um, you know, we talked about identity access management, right? So all those SaaS applications that business users are subscribing to, how do you control it when a user leaves the company that access is terminated, right? It's a security concern as well as a cost concern, right? So this is where um, item security can collaborate as well. Uh, hardware disp disposition, IT asset disposition, hardware theft, uh, all still issues, right? Just two, three months ago, Morgan Stanley was fined $35 million by the SEC for a server that they, uh, you know, they reached end of life, they uh, repurposed it or they, they sold it and there, there are hard drives there with customer data on it. Those things are still happening and they're happening to uh, well-governed companies um, as well. Otherwise, so. so that's going to continue to become even more dominant. Um, disruptive technologies, right? I've touched on, on, on just two, right? Uh, you know, blockchain. A lot of the things that we do around IT from smart contracts to how do we how we track software bill of materials and a lot of things in between um, are going to be implemented using blockchain uh, in the years to come. Uh, so that's happening uh, with a number of implications that we won't have time to, to get into. But just keep that uh, on your radar, as well as increased use of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to do what we do. So we talked about how assets are more ephemeral you know, within the cloud. Um, <clears throat> really, the only way to get there is smart automation that leverages uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, you heard about terms like AI ops and so forth. And there's there's an implication there for uh, ITAM as well. And this is the future of, of ITAM, right? You, you know, gone are the days where, you know, you, you're doing quarterly or annual uh, processes, right? They need to be more real time and given the amount of data and the growing complexity of that data, the only way to get there is really with smart automation. Uh, so we're gonna see a lot more the, of that coming. Open source getting a lot of attention as well. Um, there are different uh, standards for that. Um, you know, talking about 
companies that incorporate or open source in their products. Uh, one, one standard that's uh, discussed there is open chain. We're talking about software bill of material. One standard that's discussed there is SPDX. They're both ISO standards now as well. Software package data exchange, uh, particularly getting a lot of attention now uh, with the executive order that we discussed about and so forth. And of course, either, uh, you know, they need to be in scope for software asset management. The license itself may be free, but the, the maintenance often is not. Plus, you need to control all the asset through all stages of their life cycle, regardless of uh, if it's open source software or not. Um, so again, there's a, I definitely expect this will be an area where companies will spend a lot more uh, time and energy on. Then finally, uh, uh, operational technology, OT. Here we're talking about things like um, you know IoT and you know, like things like sensors and uh, smart equipment and, and cameras and uh, refrigerators and pretty much everything is is connected nowadays. And not only that, but increasingly in a growing number of organizations, that is being put under the responsibilities of the CIO, where it didn't used to be the case in the past. Increasingly, that is the case. Talking to more and more companies, and what that means is that that CIO will need ITAM to help manage that. That there's a number of different implications to how you implement ITAM methodologies to be effective in this kind of world um, of operational technology. Um, a lot of opportunities there. Um, again, it's an area where I think many ITAM programs are still not looking at, where they're probably going to have to over the next few years. It's because of some of those, uh, those uh, shifts. All right, so this was, again, a very, very uh, quick uh, summary of some of the main trends that we're seeing uh, are going to be impacting ITAM um, over the next few years. Um, and I think with that, we can see if there are any questions. By the way, uh, as uh, Braden mentioned, this session is going to be... Um, recorded. Um, and so you, you feel free to go back to that. If you want a copy of the slide, you can just uh, send me a quick email. We'd love to connect with each and every one of you over LinkedIn or otherwise. Um, let's let's take a look at some of the questions that have uh, come up. There was a question about uh, training for FinOps and ITAM. Um, so this is definitely something that's uh, going to happen. Um, I think the training that the FinOps Foundation is doing is going to, uh, they're looking to incorporate FinOps and ITAM elements within that. Uh, so that's one part of the discussion. There's also other uh, training options that, um, you know, we'll be looking at as angle point as well to offer. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a, an area that's, um, we're going to see a lot more options uh, going forward. Another question that I see here is about um, do we do I see a trend in item reporting under the SecOps umbrella? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think there's no uh, there's no um, no doubt that uh, item and FinOps would need to collaborate a lot more closely, and that. Um, uh, in many cases, FinOps right now lives under DevSecOps. Um, and so actually just by just because of that, I think ITAM will be uh, working a lot more closely with DevSecOps. I think historically, many ITAM programs are not doing that. And that has really come to hurt ITAM, uh, particularly with the evolving needs around FinOps. There was just a vacuum uh, that was there and FinOps filled that vacuum. And this is, um, again, was kind of a missed opportunity for ITAM to, to step up. But I think going forward, um, that's because where the technology is going, where, where the trends are going, um, for sure, ITAM will need to work much more closely with, with FinOps and with uh, DevSecOps. Um, and again, it's not just about cloud financial management. It's also about the information security aspects and, and some of the other uh, trends that we, we just discussed. Um, next question. Uh, what do you think 
the role of SAM within FinOps? How is it going to impact the SAM operations? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, long term, SAM and FinOps need to work very, very closely together. I th personally think a best practice is for uh, SAM and FinOps to be part of one function. Um, and certainly if I was a CIO, that that's the only way I would want to have it. Uh, but there may be, you know, historical or political or other organizational reasons why they need to be separate, and that's fine. Um, but if they are separate, then they need to collaborate very, very closely on a number of different areas. Um, so again, at the end of the day, what's important is that the, the work that needs to get done will get done. Um, and you can do it when the two functions are operating separately. If they have the right collaboration, sharing of data, uh, sharing of tools, um, handoffs, um, and, and specific collaboration on a number of things that we talked about, whether it's marketplace offer or bring your own license, and a number of those things that absolutely require the two functions to be working very, very closely together. So, um, and I think many in some organization where they don't have a FinOps function yet, I think it's a huge opportunity for ITAM, SAM to, to step up and, and provide that solution for the organization versus um, continuing to leave a, a vacuum. Um, as we saw, I mean, this is most of the spend dollar wise is going to be in that in that bucket, and so uh, I think it's just um, you know I can't exaggerate saying how critical it is for for ITAM and SAM to step up and uh, and evolve to address that. How could we um, be more prepared as ITAM to follow the trend? Yeah, there's probably a number of activities that need to be done. The first is just from a, you know educational perspective, uh, just staying on top of these topics, uh, collaborating, collaborating, collaborating with the different organizational functions that, uh, that touch on these areas. Um, so, you know, getting to work a lot more closely with your cybersecurity team, a lot more closely with your TBM office if you have one. If not, if you don't have one. In your organization, right? The financial uh, management office. Maybe that's an opportunity for ITEM to take the lead in creating one. Uh, you know, working with uh, FinOps, DevSecOps, uh, and so forth. So it's really education and really starting to work a lot more closely with those different functions to um, and stakeholders to start creating deliverables um, and showing the values that we can bring. Uh, from an IT asset management perspective. And there's, there's a lot more detail related to each each one of those uh, trends that we can talk about specifically and what, what some of the things that we, we're seeing, uh, some of the best practices, companies that are ahead of the curve and what are they doing that's working well. Um, and happy to have those um, conversations offline. All right, well, um, I really want to really thank everyone for, uh, for joining. Um, our last webinar of the year, we had hundreds of people who, who registered for this uh, for this webinar. So really great participation. Um, again, um, anyone who wants to get the, the slides, please reach out to me. Happy to connect with all of you. And wanted to wish all of you really happy holidays. Um, have a great, um, great peaceful time with all your uh, family and friends. And we'll uh, look forward to... Uh, really interesting 2023 ahead of us. Thanks, everyone.